A FAM production. Furniture and mattress. FAM.news. Welcome to part two of the best of Dos Marcos for 2021. We here hope you had a very Merry Christmas and that it was exactly what you were hoping it would be. For those of you just tuning into the podcast, if this is your first time, welcome. I'm Adrian. I'm the executive producer filling in for the Marks. Or if it's not your first time, but you missed part one of this two-part series, just search Best of Dos Marcos Part 1 in Spotify, Apple Podcast, or wherever you stream and listen in on some of the best wisdom and insights we received during the first half of the year. We hope you enjoy Part 2, and we'll see you in 2022. Driven entrepreneurs, listen up. It's time to team up with Nationwide Marketing Group, North America's most successful network of independent retailers. You'll gain access to programs and services that level the playing field between you and the national chains. Industry-leading digital marketing, increased buying power, exclusive networking events, and of course, their awesome learning platform. Nationwide Marketing Group is the business partner that helps you get results and stay ahead of the competition. Take the first step today and visit nationwidegroup.org. Do you want more sales in three easy clicks? Yeah. It starts right now at doorcounts.com. With a completely redesigned user interface, gathering data has never been easier. Click number one, your salespeople connect with the customer as they walk through the door. Click two is the outcome. Click three, key performance metrics right there on your phone from anywhere at any time. Now your salespeople can spend their time selling and DoorCounts is going to gather the data you need to make your business better. Start right now at doorcounts.com. Welcome to the Dos Marco Show with Mark Kinsley and Mark Quinn, where mattress and furniture leaders gather to grow, get the inside scoop, tell stories, and take tequila shots. Uno, dos, tequila! Welcome aboard. Here's your passport to a planet filled with the mattress industry's brightest minds and biggest ideas. Meet your guides. I'm Mark Kinsley, president and CEO of Englander. And I'm Mark Quinn, co-founder of Spink & Co. and VP of Sherwood Betting. Together, they are Dos Marcos. The galaxy's greatest mattress podcast has liftoff in three, two, one. Um, March was the single biggest mattress month in our history, followed up by April, which then became our single biggest month in our history. And so we started looking at May. And of course, we were excited by two months in a row of record breaking numbers uh, and the results that we were getting. Uh, and our BOS kept increasing over and over, you know, um, we like to be no less than 20% of our BOS. We're currently running at 24% in the mattress category compared to the other, uh, the other categories. And so we looked at May and we said, what are we going to do for the summer of sleep? And we knew one of the things we wanted to do was to do a training as a reward and to do something that is typically not done. Most people look upon training. I won't go as far as to say it's a punishment but very few salespeople are excited about going to training sometimes. So um, I really wanted to elevate that. So we decided to call it a race to the summit. What's a summit? It's a gathering of individuals, top-notch individuals. We wanted to offer a training program that was going to be, now check this out. It's eight hours long. It's from nine, to nine o'clock in the morning till five o'clock uh, in the evening. It's eight solid hours of solid mattress training, like really. And we only wanted the best of the best. And so when you're doing training, a lot of times you got to train to the lowest common denominator so you don't leave anyone behind. No child left behind kind of concept. What we wanted to do was reward the positive behavior. So we decided to make May the contest. So from May 1st through May 31st, obviously last day being Memorial Day, was the race to the summit. And we were looking for the top 25 individuals during the month of May. Now your reward for actually going to doing this was one, you get to go to eight hours of training on your day off. 
Now we are going to pay them to actually come, which was like $300, but we don't want to take them away from their floor. So you got to come on your day off. We're doing four identical trainings on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, starting on June 22nd. So it's coming up uh, next week, but it'll be, but that's the reward. And because we're dealing with the best of the best, this level of training dives much deeper than just the typical surface training that we do to our typical furniture salespeople. These people are already good, but here's my own kind of philosophy. If you're on a scale of one to 10 and you're a two, if I make you 20% better, you're a 2.4, you're still worthless. Now, if you're an eight and I make you 20% better, you're 9.6, game changer. And so this was trying to take the best of the best salespeople that we have, put them in a room together, sharing over that. It's kind of like when the three of us get together, you know, where you really get explosive knowledge and training and best practices with a real deep dive uh, into some of our categories. So, yeah, that's where that, but that drove the month of May. And so May not only was our single biggest month ever that beat April and March, but it was up by like 20% more than our previous record we'd ever had. I was just amazed. Don't look at all the problems. Yeah, do we have some flaws in our society? Do we need to wrong, right some of our wrongs? In our society? Yes. However, we are still here and success can be had. So I don't, I'm, I'm not a victim. I don't do victim mindset. Uh, I don't make excuses. Someone said to me, well, they're not excuses, but they're reasons. I go, reasons is a nice word for excuses. Well put. You know, I, hey, look, bringing it home, like real close to home, just moments before we started recording the podcast, I'm talking to my nephew about, you are not helpless. Don't say I don't know anymore because you are not helpless. Tell me what you can do. And you're right. We, we all have stories and you know, it's such a good reminder to, to sit back and be like, boy, you, you, ha- I'm sure you guys have had this happen. You're upset at somebody maybe, and you get your feathers ruffled. And then you find out this seemingly super successful person who is in front of you, like had something really tragic happen like the day before, but they're still showing up and doing their best. And then your heart melts and your empathy kicks in. And if you just come to the table imagining everybody has that story like you talked about, Javon, that you don't know about, boy, it's a good kind of default, default position to, to bring to the table. Well, you, you know, yeah. you're, I mean, for, for all like the emotional turmoil that you had growing up, you're, you're, you're an enlightened cat. I mean, like you, what was that journey like? How did you become this way? You know, man, um, I, I, again, I gotta, I gotta take this back to my dad. Um, my dad had decided to take the pimp game to Houston, Texas, and my mom was facing, uh, prison time for welfare fraud. So I got shipped to Houston, Texas. I was nine years old. Um, <clears throat> and when we were in Houston, my it, it, two parts. I'm gonna I'm gonna really share with you what 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 Houston was like when I got there. So this was the first time I had ever been away from my mom for more than than a weekend. So I get shipped to Houston uh, in July, and and when I get there, my dad, his prostitute, and my six month old half sister are living in a hourly rate motel, the Surrey House Motel. I'll never forget it. We all know what goes down at the hourly rate motel. <laughs> So two days after I get there, my dad and the prostitute say, we'll be back. And they leave. And they leave me with my six-month-old sister. I'm nine. And I have no clue what to do with a baby. And, and literally, what, what do babies do immediately when five minutes later, what she started doing, crying. So, man, I, I didn't know what to do. I picked her up. I'm trying to console her. Shh, it's okay. It's okay. It's going to be okay. And, you know, we're 10, 15 minutes into this, man. And, and I started to go into panic mode because I'm thinking to myself, okay, I don't know how to make a bottle. What do babies eat? How do you change a diaper? Like what? And, and I'm sheer panics going on now because I don't know what to do. Man, we're 20 minutes into this. And I threw my baby sister uh, across the room. 
And the moment my baby sister left my my hands, man, I, I just remember thinking to myself, my God, what kind of, of monster throws a baby? And man, by the grace of God, my, my baby sister landed on the couch. So I go over and I pick her up. She's screaming. I'm crying. I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm panicking. I'm, I'm so stressed. And then the prostitute shows up and she tells me to get out because she's got a man with her. It's time to do business. And she tells me to take my sister with me. So we walk out into this parking lot, July, Houston, Texas, sweltering heat. Humidity's just nasty. My baby sister's got on nothing but a diaper. She's sweating. I'm sweating. Man, I'm trying to find shade just to keep us somewhat uh, sheltered. And I'm, man, I just want to go home. I just want my mom, man. I, I want, I don't know what's going on. Why is this happening? So this is, that's what I arrived to. But what, what also took place to, to answer your question directly, one of the greatest things happened when we were in Houston. I had never, all I knew was poor. All I knew was public housing. All I knew was trying to get by, welfare, food stamps, standing in line, waiting for the bus, going to laundromats, you you name it. We were poor. And that's all I knew. My dad drove me through, I, I was 10 at this point. He drove me through a neighborhood in Houston, Texas called River Oaks. It's one of the most exclusive neighborhoods in, in the, the country. And man, I saw five, 10, $25 million homes where one family lived in these homes. Some of these homes were bigger than the housing projects I grew up in. And it was in that moment, I remember saying to myself, I want one of those and I'm going to have one of those. My dad never said anything. I don't even, I, I don't know that he was driving me through there for any reason. He may have been going through there for himself. But he never said anything, never gave me any direction. But I remember seeing those houses and I said, okay, I want one of those. And what was so moving for me was it showed me what was possible. See, I didn't know that I didn't even know those things existed. I didn't even know they were possible. And what that did for me was show possibility. And from then on, if I could see it, oh, then okay, then I know it exists. I'll go get it. It may take time. I may have to be consistent. I may have to give up things. I may have to just go 18 hours straight. But if it exists, I'll go get it. So long story short, we ended up getting a meeting in Las Vegas with a, a gentleman by the name of Todd Miller and Rick Anderson, president of Tempur-Pedic. And the two buyers that I was working with, uh, Kara and Chris, we all had this big meeting in Las Vegas and you got to understand, I'm just this one little guy, you know, just one little store. And we had this big meeting about Tempur-Pedic and the girls are all excited about this. And I could see Rick Anderson in the corner, you know, and he was just kind of sitting there and he was processing everything. And the other gentleman was, yeah, let's do it. You know, let's try it. And we were going to offer this, what we called the Costco bundle and give some free gifts away and so forth. And Long story short, that turned out, that was in 2008. And everybody knows what was happening in 2008. The economy was coming to a halt. <clears throat> and if you think about it, um, there was a lot of guys in our industry that were closing their doors and so forth. And we had the three largest years in our company history in that period of time doing tempur at the road shows in Costco. And at that time I had heard that it was the largest road show that had, that they had ever done uh, volume wise. That was at that time. That was, that was years back. But um, so th that was kind of our start into the mattress business. Pump the brakes for a moment. What was your involvement with that road show. It sounds like you brought together Costco and you brought together Tempur-Pedic and here you are sandwiched in the middle of it and the road show happens. Were you on the road show doing the dog and pony, helping people understand the product? Did you have a team with you? What was your involvement? Yes. Yeah, exactly. It was our team. Um, 
we had some great people that worked a lot of hours and they would sit there and they would, they knew the product. And the, the cool thing about it was it was only four beds and we had this great display and you had this captured audience of Costco buyers who is perfect for this. And so we, yeah, we were doing the selling, we were doing the delivering, um, we were doing everything. And it was, it was, it was awesome. It was, it was the best thing that could have happened to us. Here's the lay of the land I want us to think about. SSB, Serta Simmons Betting, pulled out of their Las Vegas market lease in 2020, and they went to virtual shows. And they've not shown signs of renewing a lease at Las Vegas market. But meanwhile, when you go to the buying group shows, who's there? Everybody. SSB. Yeah. SSB launched their 15X Arctic product. It's supposed to be 15 times cooler. Uh, they, they reached out to us about it and told us about it. Sure enough, there it was on display. That's where that product launch was happening. It was not, not happening at Las Vegas market because they're not there. You know, I heard that spring air wasn't there. King coil didn't open up. Ashley didn't open up the biggest exhibitor at Las Vegas market on the 16th floor of the C building, a building C or a one of the others, they have the express elevator. That's all I know. So when you look at the lay of the land, does it just evolve? You know, back in the day you had, Dallas market, you had San Francisco was a mattress market at one point. Now it's Vegas in the winter. That's the big market. Do we need the summer market? People are starting to question that. So I, I don't know. I don't know if it's a one approach fits all, but it does show the shift in the landscape. And I think the coastline for markets and mattress introductions has been altered. Now, what is it going to look like whenever the storm passes and 2022 does roll around? Well, heck. Everybody thought when 2021 rolled around, things were going to be more stable and they haven't proven to be. So I just think those dynamics are worth looking at because if I'm putting my money in the pot, if I'm spending my cash to merchandise my retail floor, I got to get my hands on something. And I don't think when it comes to big items, when it comes to the aesthetic and the feel and the, how does it sit, how does it lay, if I'm investing my money, thinking I can, I can sell this. I, I got to get my hands on this stuff. It's a thought. So on the tracking information side, Kinsley, it's like the speech we gave for nationwide, right? So there's an acknowledgement. You can wear a Fitbit. You can have your Apple watch. You can have a passive system in your bed, whatever the, the technology is. And after so many nights of sleep, yeah, I get it, right? I drink wine at night. I don't sleep as well. I understand that, right? Change my exercise pattern or I take a different prescription because now it's keeping... You know, after so many of those things, you go, yep, I get it. It's not going to help me. It's kind of like when you're doing the same thing on a scale, you eat too much food, you have a bad week, you're eating pizzas all week, you're out traveling, you come back, you put a couple pounds on, right? So the scale is going to tell you that you're not doing well with nutrition. The passive monitoring systems are going to tell you about sleep. It's not about that. It's about the transformation of it all, right? So it's how do you not only educate the sleeper, but how do you help them transform their patterns and behavior into better sleep. That's what I mean by actionable insight. Uh, or, right. or, or, or better yet, better even than actionable insight would be, as Jeff pointed out, just like making the change for you automatically. Just But give me an it. example of that. Give me an example. Like your bed comfort, I get that. Maybe there's less pressure somewhere. I get maybe your temperature regulation. It could drop it down for you a little bit. Right. Uh, maybe a snooze environment where the head of your bed comes up a little bit, right? Those types of things. Yeah. So were those good examples that I just gave you? Yeah. Those were, those seemed good. Well, no, I'm, I'm saying we know those <laughs> examples already. Are there more coming? I mean, do you think there's more than that? Right. I, I'm sure there are more coming, but those I think are really okay. great prototypical examples of the types of things we're talking about. But what I was going to just, just to finish my previous thought on this, like, I think the risk here is for a leader in this industry. You want to keep your eye on the horizon as it relates to where we're headed, which I do think is in this direction, no question. But you also have to be mindful of timetables, what's realistic, what can happen when, and also and what people are expecting and needing and wanting in the meantime. And I think there is a risk of pushing your focus maybe too much into that stuff, taking your eye off of just the fundamentals of creating mattresses that are going to deliver like 
spine alignment, pressure relief, like motion isolation, whatever, whatever the other characteristics are that people are looking for, uh, in the interim. So I, I, you know, I'm not saying that I think that, uh, Philip or Joe are coming on the wrong side of that in any way. I'm only saying that like to Kinsley's question about, uh, is there a double edged sword here? I do think there is to a degree. I think you have to kind of keep your eye on the horizon while also keeping your eye on the road in front of you, which may not be the same exact, uh, prior, may not have the same exact priorities. And I think one of the things I look at is follow the money. Eight Sleep just announced an $86 million round. Uh, with uh, a funding after a $40 million round previously. So clearly there are people out there that, um, in my opinion, at this point, I think they're probably playing the long game of what will the data give us. You know, it's like, uh, clear, not Clearasil, but what was the name of the company that had like acne medication? It's on TV. Justin Bieber was on there. Proactive. Proactive. Or something. Yeah. Proactive. There you go. Yeah, so I found out from a friend who had looked into that company that they made something like, you know, it was like $350 million in sales off their actual product, but they sold data about teenagers for well over a billion dollars. So their data was their actual product that they were selling and making money off of. So I think, you know, if you're going to follow the money, what are they thinking right now? Oh, we got to get a gadget inside of a mattress? No, I don't think they care less about that. I think to your point, Jeff, they are hoping that we can make this technology disappear into the background to the point where, yeah, if I'm a consumer and I'm interested in health, I can access that data and improve my sleep. And that's what they're going to sell it on the front end as. But on the backside, think of all of the data that we're going to be able to um, mine and cultivate. And then people are going to be able to sell if they have people you know, choosing and self-selecting in to give that data to you each and every night for a third of their life. You know, and as we head into this path of health mattering more than ever in, in the age of COVID, um, you know, there are ways, you know, to, to early detect, um, sickness of, and I think we're, I think most people now are going to say, yeah, I want to know sooner rather than later if I am sick, but it's going to go well beyond COVID. It's going to go into other arenas aware as well. And once you start talking healthcare, um, then, then it's a whole different conversation. And I think that data set that you could get from a sleeper is going to be very valuable. I think that's where a lot it's of headed. People look at innovation in our industry as a driver of consumer interest. I think that can certainly be the case. And then you have another course of people, many of them consumers who say, I just want something I know is going to work. How does TSI think about those two worlds, how they combine the importance of technology? in a mattress, both in terms of driving the category forward and for the consumer. And how do those worlds weave together? These people that are, I want something that works versus I'm an early adopter. And I think about the techie side of things. Yeah. I mean, I guess to some extent, and I come from, again, technology industries, you're always going to have some segment of early adopters who may be inclined to do, you know, kind of tracking of their, you know, their health, their, their fitness activities, in this case, their sleep. Um, I don't think that's what gets you kind of across the chasm, as it were, and as it's often kind of discussed as technologies take, um, you know, hold in society. What I go back to then is innovation isn't necessarily as effective when it's innovation for its sake, because it's possible, uh, than if it's for the sake of the consumer. And th therefore, I go back to what can innovation or technology do to help consumers address maybe uh, problems that they have or address opportunities in this case that they have to get smarter about their sleep. And if we can uh, leverage innovation and technology in, in such a way and then educate the consumer about its legitimate merits in the industry um, to help them, uh, then I think we're much more likely to see traction. And that, that, that innovation could take the form, again, of the cooling technologies we built into Temper Breeze or, you know, the automatic sensing and responding to snoring in the case of our Ergo Smart Base product. All of those have a fairly clear consumer benefit, and that benefit is uh, one that addresses an acute need that they have 
And that's the way you gain traction. You know, it's cliche, but you've probably heard that people don't buy drills, they buy holes, right? Consumers aren't looking for a better drill. They're looking for a better hole, like a quarter inch hole, right? In this case, they're not looking for technology for its sake. Some of them might be. They're looking for a better night's sleep. And so that's in this, you know, parallel, that's the hole. And so if we address that hole and we happen to do so through innovation, then that's where the a potential while ago, lies. Kinsey, do you remember that blog post I wrote, Five Signs an Outsider uh, Won't Make It in the Mattress Industry? And it was really when Michael Traub came on board. And I wasn't saying that Michael Traub wasn't going to be successful. I was saying, it, and so he actually confronted me on that at one point. It was kind of funny. He was like, yeah, I, know, I remember that, that blog post. I, I introduced myself, and he's like, I know who you are. You wrote a blog post saying I was going to fail. I said, no, I did not write a blog post saying you're going to fail. I wrote a blog post saying if you do the five things in this blog, you will fail. So those things were things like, and I'm going to toss it to you for your, your, your feedback, but do you underestimate the complexity of the industry, right? A lot of people do. They come, oh, well, I'm from this industry or this industry, and they try to apply the logic to the mattress category. Um, there's very little appreciation for the longstanding relationships. And I think, you know, let, let, let's not just focus on Casper. Look at, um, you know, Art Van and what happened to them. Look at um, Levitz and, and, I mean, in different furniture companies, Heilig Myers, when they brought in all these private equity guys, look what happened to these businesses. They didn't value the trade knowledge of the industry. Um, number three, they didn't really learn their way in. So, you know, it's not just when you enter a new category, like the first 90 days, aren't you just keeping your mouth shut and in meetings and trying to gather information? I don't think a lot of them do that. Number four, you can't assume what worked in the past is going to work here, right? So we kind of just talked about, and the other one is respect, you know, respect for the retailers out there, you know, and it's earned, it's not given, right? And so you can't go into, I've, I've had you know people in private equity inside this category, I've, I've heard them telling retailers uh, new principles in, in beliefs they have after coming into the category. And then they, they go hard with that explanation. And the people sitting there listening are like, you're a freaking moron. And they're like, yeah, that's fine, but it doesn't work here. And here's why. So what are your thoughts about that? Do you think I covered the, the slippery slope that many of these guys coming in that bring the outsiders inside? You think that's a fair way to assess that problem? Well, I think you have two very noticeable camps of, of outsiders that become insiders. I was an outsider at one point, and you brought me onto the inside and took me through mattress boot camp. I went to ISPA, I went to the market, I went to the betting conference all within the first year. And I remember I was sitting there listening, asking questions, trying to pick up as much as I possibly could. And it was overwhelming at times. And it made me realize how little I knew about this category and how no matter what industry you're going into, there are people who know so much more and have spent their entire lives, have family businesses involved. So you have the people that are, that are willing to come in and listen and learn. And I think that you know, a few of them that, that have done a really good job, you look back at Rick Anderson with Tempur-Pedic, you know, he came from Duracell and from the outside, even Tom Murray, the CMO, the current CMO of Tempur-Pedic, Tom was on our podcast recently, you should, you should definitely look up the episode with Tom. And Scott Murray. Thompson, he was uh, but, a car you know, guy, worked... right? He was with car rental companies. Yeah, Scott Thompson, the CEO of Temper. I think that entire crew has done a really good job of uh, acknowledging the people in the industry who have the relationships, who understand downstream what's happening all the way to the retail sales associate level, what's happening with manufacturers and suppliers and transportation and business services, the entire swirling ecosystem of the industry, learning your way in and surrounding yourself with people who know how to navigate those worlds. And then I think you have people that are hell bent on disruption or I know that this way can work because I'm an internet ninja, um, which is great, but then the, you have a hard time kind of acknowledging, okay, what else is happening out there that I can learn? What do I need to know? And am I willing to be a student and get rid of my own curse of knowledge? You can bounce on it. Oh, oh.
What is a hybrid? It's like peanut butter jelly, peanut butter chocolate. Hybrid so tight, there's no way that you could topple it. Hybrid on my wrist, that's a calculator watch. We add ourselves together and we take it up a notch. Got the airflow, yo, keep you cool as it get. Visco foam alone to make you drip sweat. Get a hybrid mattress, yes, you'll get better rest. Cool and comfortable, I'm hybrid like a sweater vest. Oh. You know the game, we're ahead of the sun. Cause the two of us together are way better than one. Cause I'm cool. Cool as ice, and I'm hot like a heater. Bounce by the ounce, now, now we, we got, got it by the leader. Well, you take a spring and you wrap it up right. You can sleep so smooth, the bounce all night. Yeah. Put two together, get a whole lot more. Get the feel of the comfort core. You can bounce on it. Lay it back, you don't have to practice. It's the best thing to happen to your mattress. Yeah. Get together to do it like I did. Everybody get high. If you want somebody to get in your vicinity, you probably want to feel a little bit of a hybridity. Foam alone, out of five, maybe one star. Springs and foam, we're taking care of that lumbar. Mad back support, the best way to shack up or just get rest that won't mess your back up. Like a hot chick mixed with a particle physicist or a mullet. Party in the back of the business. Best of both worlds like Mars and Venus. The ultimate hybrid. Nothing short of cheap. Keeping it loose while keeping it tight We can make you sleep or play all night Put two together, get a whole lot more Get the feel of a comfort core You can bounce on it No stopping when the beat gets played back Springs keep it popping, foam keeps it laid back Party over here, get invited Everybody get high Kitchen is charming when your bedroom's the most important part of the apartment. What kind of bed do you keep back there? Does your girl wanna chill on a beanbag chair? Hell no! You need springs and foam, cause if that bowling ball don't bounce, you'll be sleeping alone. And if the bed don't react, then you can't get low. We, we got, got the, the type, type of bounce that won't spill your Merlot. So stick with us and you'll get rewarded. Cause I'm so gentle and I'm so supportive. Where the magic is. And we just killed a song about mattresses. Yeah.